Once again, I'm glad to be with you. I'm Father Terrence Curley, and this is program number three. And the title of the program is Necessity of Funerals. I believe this is very important for us in our culture to take a look for a few moments about the funeral, and it's very consistent with everything we've done so far. What we've talked about is the importance of finding meaning and finding hope and completing our story in many ways and telling our story to others. And certainly the experience of, of death is painful in itself, but so painful that very often in our society, people run away from it. They run away from it for a number of reasons. They run away from it because of just living in one dimension and not being caught up in the ultimacy of life. They run away from it because they feel that, well, the way we do funerals isn't meaningful. And that doesn't tie in with the ritual. It ties in more with the, the customs in our country as to how we actually uh, treat the death of a, of a person. And the high cost of funerals and, and all of that is, has made everything pretty complex. And people find that, especially now in light of cremation, that there are alternate forms of, of burial. How does this speak to us as Christians? And how does this speak to us about the necessity of funerals. Well, the funeral itself as a ritual sets the tone for the way we go through grief. It sets the tone for our bereavement. It helps us to realize what is meaningful. Traditionally, we think of uh, the funeral as a, a rite of passage, a rite of separation. And most anthropologists would talk about it that way, that we really go through a separation and it's, it's a closure, it's a change. But the thinking has evolved on that as well. Yes, there is a relinquishing of a physical presence, but at the same time, there is a deepening of a communion, and we've talked so much about that, a deepening of a communion with a continual bond. And that bonding is not severed, because we believe that when we lose someone that we love, we have to redefine our relationship. Certainly, we, we realize that now we have a spiritual relationship. And that's why our consciousness at the time of a loss is so very important as to the decisions that we make and how we really remember those who have gone before us in faith. Remembering is so very important. And remembering tells us so much about how we make a person present to us. And as I said before, we, we've learned so much more from the bereaved, from people who grieve, so much more that we've actually changed the model. Changed the model from detaching and saying separation. Relinquishing is a better word. Relinquishing certain things. But always keeping in mind that they are present to us. Very often when I celebrate the vigil, whether it's in a funeral home or certainly in the church, I ask the people to think about the person who died. And in thinking about them, I ask them to realize that they're more present to us in death than they are at any other time. Now, I look out and I see some perplexed looks. People say, well, how can the priest be saying that? That they're more present to us at this time than any other. Well, they're present in our consciousness, in our mind. We recall things that were long forgotten. It might be a gesture, it might be some sort of an action that they did or, or the way they cooked. Sometimes I ask, was the person a good cook? And if it's a woman, uh, there are other roles that we may relate to, like sewing. Not that men don't do that, but there are other roles as well. Did she sew? Did she do this? Did she do that? And that, of course, engages them for a conversation. And then they, they realize, as I realize, that they're more present to us in our mind with things that we thought were long forgotten, things that were in the resources of our mind way probably hidden, and they come to the surface. But that's the way we grieve. But we need to do that, and we need opportunities to do that. So if we live in a, a culture that denies the rituals to families, that family members make decisions that really the, uh, the, the parents perhaps never wanted, we have parents that certainly have given their lives and lived their lives in, 
in the life of the church. What happens when another generation comes along and they're not as committed and they may not realize the importance of prayer, the importance of coming together, and the importance psychologically and spiritually, a healthy, holy way of living is to actually express ourselves through rituals. The rituals communicate so very much and they are necessary for healing. They are necessary to maintain that connection because if we realize as we celebrate the liturgy, especially the funeral liturgies that we have in the new order of Christian funerals, especially that there is a whole underlying platform, structure, foundation that is necessary for our culture and one that we don't always adhere to. We don't always realize the importance of it. We don't always focus on what's really important. We focus on the material things. And that's why the American way of death, the American way of doing things has to be looked at, especially in light of everything we've talked about so far, especially in light of the fact that we're more spiritual than we are physical beings, especially in light of the fact that we believe that the material things are not what, we, what really guide us, especially that's, that's evident in our ritual, at the, the vigil mass, it's, at the vigil, the vigil itself, we hear, only your good deeds go with you. And that's the spiritual reality. And that's a reality for all of us. So the importance in the new order of Christian funerals, the importance of families coming together and making the decisions that are important, the decisions that their parents want. Sometimes it's even suggested that uh, along with a health care proxy that people leave with their will, that should be readily accessible and should be available to whoever is the health care proxy person, there should be another proxy. And that proxy should actually be my wishes for my burial, my wishes for my funeral. And those in good faith can be carried out. But we need to spell that out. So parishes and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, and institutions have a challenge, and the challenge is to say, along with the healthcare proxy, what type of a, a burial would you like? What would you would you want to have uh, the experience of being buried in the church with the rituals surrounding the death of a Christian? The rituals that we fill a couple of days with prayer. We fill a couple of days with meaning. We fill a couple of days with hope. And we help people express, the bereaved express, their true innermost feelings. So there are questions about the cultural aspect of it. Before we talk about the actual ritual and the, and the uh, celebration of the order of Christian funerals, let's look for a moment at the cultural aspects of it. Cultural aspects can sweep us up, and they do sweep us up, into something that we don't really have any control over. We're led around, and being led around, we make decisions that aren't always the best decisions, and aren't always the most meaningful decisions. We make decisions about the cost, and I remember when I was in, uh, when I was in graduate school that my major professor, and I used to have to see him every week as I was writing my my dissertation at Boston University back in 1990. And he used to talk about the importance of social justice underlying everything that we do in pastoral care. And there is an element of social justice here, a very strong one. We don't want to ever have first and second class funerals. We don't want to have funerals for those who can afford all the uh, accruements and all of the things that, that, are, that are done and then have someone else with a cloth casket, which is what's done. Or someone feeling that, well, this is the best we can do. Or have a cremation and say, well, we'll keep the urn. And uh, that isn't the way Christian burial works. But people meaningfully uh, think it's meaningful, uh, do that. They don't, they don't bury the ashes, and, or the cremains as we call them. And that, of course, takes away from the wonderful sign value of resurrection and of locating our loved ones' uh, remains, their real place, 
is in the kingdom of heaven that continues to connect with us, but locating a sacred spot, a sacred place. Back in uh, 1993, you know, when you, when you write your, your dissertation, uh, it's pretty technical, and no one really wants to publish it because uh, you have to rewrite it and make it more understandable and something that, that can help and more practical. So what we're really talking about here is a practical Christianity, not something that's esoteric or removed or, or uh, not something that we can relate to, but trying to relate it always to the needs of the people. Interestingly enough, before I talk about a book I wrote back in 1993, which is a spinoff from my dissertation, the title of my dissertation at Boston University in, in 1989, I wrote the, I received the doctorate in 1990, but in 1989, I wrote my dissertation. It was on the, the new order of Christian funerals, 1989, and the needs of the bereaved in a Roman Catholic parish. Kind of a technical title, but an important title because it focused me on the needs of the bereaved. And those needs are changing in our understanding about how people grieve. And I think I'd even make some changes. I don't have to make a lot of changes in what I wrote because I focused then on the order itself and I focused on how people responded to what it meant. And that's what we're talking about in terms of grief. Not detaching, but what does this mean for you? What did this, how did this help you to change your world view? How did this help you to actually tell your story? How did this help you to help others and to look forward, have a vision of the kingdom of heaven, look forward to the hopes of a heavenly reunion? How did this help you? Do we want to do that? And do families want to do that to each other? They do, and they should. But to just fall in with the culture and say, well, we're just going to go along with the, the, the usual ways of burial without, without a ritual is a, is a terrible mistake. So I wrote this book uh, called Console One Another. It's out of print now because I have another book that I, I rewrote, which is called uh, From This, uh, called Peace Beyond Understanding. I'll talk about that in a moment. Console One Another did very well. It was with Sheed and Ward, and they're not around anymore. But I wrote in the afterword something that I thought was very important for our understanding about, about burial and about, about funerals. It was called The New Ritual and the Same Practices. All right? And I think there's one paragraph I just want to read to you that I think uh, will help, and then I'll mention one other thing that's important as well. The Order of Christian Funerals has a pastoral vision which puts the liturgical celebration at odds with the materialistic attitudes of funerals. The ritual raises the question of responsibility for the preparation and celebration of the funeral. The new ritual stresses the parish as the primary minister to the bereaved. And that's what's important is if we get caught up in the material and we get caught up in the uh, in, in the, uh, the externals, then we're going to miss what really is important. And that happens all the time. And it happens because of the high cost, and there's a social justice question here. Why does it have to be the way it is? Why do we even have viewings? We don't really have to have it. There's no real psychology that says acceptance comes along because we see a loved one in death. As I talked in the last video I did, the one before this one, we talked about uh, uh, the whole idea of Ruth Davis Konigsberg, criticism of that, and saying that the reason why people are kept for two or three days and the, the rationale behind it was to create a memory image. That's what the, the funerals say, the funeral industry says. But it isn't a funeral image that we want. It isn't that type of a memory image that we want. And so I think it can be very counterproductive and it can work against us rather than work for us in finding meaning and finding hope. Robert Hovda, one of the leading liturgists of our day, uh, talks about choosing a coffin, choosing a casket. 
And that's something that we have to look at as well. I want to read you what he said. He said, the container for the dead body of a believer should be honestly that, and beautiful as simple and well-crafted things are beautiful. Liturgical books of the church tell that any kind of pomp or display should be avoided. The dead body is the sign of the person is what demands honor and reverence, not the, not the coffin. So sometimes everything is sort of focused on how do things look? How do they appear? And I'm standing there and you're standing there with loved ones and it's as if they're on a couch and everyone's coming in. I think it's changing. I see more of that now. Certainly with cremation it's changing. And certainly uh, with other forms of, uh, of ways of, of appreciating the funeral, it's changing. It's changing because people are saying, that isn't, the, that isn't how I find meaning. That isn't something I want to go through. And as a church, we don't say you have to go through that at all. What we're saying is, we're here to provide a ritual to help you to connect with them in eternity and to express the best possible expression of meaning that you can give to your loved ones. That's the idea, that's the vision, non-materialistic vision of the order of Christian funerals. This instruction has to get out there, even more so. Even though it's been so many years since 1989 when the, uh, when the ritual was promulgated, even though the catechesis has to still take effect, we still have to instruct our parishes, instruct our bereavement committees, instruct our parish councils to dialogue with all of those who are concerned at the death of a Christian. That includes our families, our friends, and, uh, and certainly the funeral industry as well, the funeral directors. Dialogue about what's the most meaningful thing for this family. Not what's the most expensive, what's the most meaningful. And what really will help them in their sense of redefining their relationship and finding a new image and a new way of relating. There isn't any real closure at death. We've always talked about closure. Well, it's been confused with relinquishing. And closure means that it's over and now you move on to something else. And everything I've said so far in this DVD and certainly previously and when I talk to my students as well, is not about closure. It's about finding meaning. It's about realizing that those who we love continue in a relationship and faith with us. And that relationship and faith is what really matters. The funeral, to understand it, is a rite of passage in that sense that as baptism is a rite of passage, it's a change, it's a transformation, it's crossing over a threshold that's true. That's why in the very beginning of the liturgy, we, we actually greet the mourners with the, with the casket or with the cremains at the, at the entrance of the church because we're going to cross over, they're going to cross over that threshold. That threshold that they first were carried over before in their life at the time of baptism. They were carried into the church surrounded by the family as it was then, their family, their friends, and gathered together around the font and gathered together to be reborn. St. Paul sets the tone for that. St. Paul tells us, are you not aware that we who were baptized were baptized into Christ Jesus? What a wonderful penetrating question Paul gives us. And then he goes on and tells us, as we were baptized, he's explaining it to us, so too we were baptized into his death, but we were also baptized into his resurrection. See the whole experience of, of dying and rising, of being immersed in, and rising. This is, this is the, the miracle of, of new life, the miracle of a new creation, the miracle of entering into the new covenant. And isn't that what we've been talking about? We've been talking about ritual. We've been talking about new models, a new design for the way we grieve. From being shattered, being dead, 
being paralyzed, being overwhelmed, to being restored, to being rebuilt. Doesn't mean we go back ever to where we were. It means we go forward and we grow in a relationship with God and we're bonded not only to ourselves with God, but certainly with the whole community of faith. It's a whole people of God theology. That, and that's the way we should be we're mourning as a people of God. That's what is so very important, that we realize our connectedness, not our separateness, not separating, not separation. We look to Paul again, and Paul's right in the ritual. Paul is definitely quoted in the instructions at the beginning of each one of, of the moments or the stations for those two days, the stops that we have towards the burial of a Christian, and ultimately our prayers connecting to the kingdom of God. Paul tells us in Romans, I think it is, that when one member of the body, when one member of the body suffers, we all do. And that's our responsibility to love one another, to be empathic, and to realize that if one member suffers, certainly we all suffer. And that's, that's the connectedness that we've been talking about for quite some time. And now we look, we look at the ritual and we realize that that does that. We journey together, not by ourselves, but we journey together with our family and our friends towards our resting place, towards where we will rest as a Christian, towards the cemetery. The cemetery is a holy place, and we'll talk about that as we talk about the stations and move in that direction. But I think what we have to realize is not to offer a ritual and to cut back on funerals and not to do them and not to do them in a meaningful way as we do in the church is an example of disenfranchised grief for a family. Disenfranchised grief means when we overlook something, when we ignore something. And we don't want to have that happen to other family members. And we certainly don't in the memory of those whom we love and our continual relationship with them. We don't want to be guilty of disenfranchised grief. But our culture does that. Our society does that. Because it's ignoring and overlooking the meaning. And as we said all the way through in our journey so far together, that it's not about detaching. It's about meaning. And it's about hope. That family and friends coming together for the funeral liturgy is a unique. It's what we call an incidental community. They're there because of that incidence. That community probably will never be formed again the same way. So the community we see is the community. And it's important that that community be given the real experiences of worship, the real experiences of meaning, the real experiences of remembering in the context of faith. It requires planning. And I, I wrote a book, small booklet, but it, it certainly has helped, I hope. It's called Planning the Catholic Funerals with Liturgical Press. And it outlines, probably for anyone who wants to plan a funeral, the different things we have to do. Because the reason for this is that we want ministry and participation as we approach the order of Christian funerals. As we sit down and plan, we need to plan and we need to know our options. We need to know how the family participates, how we're involved, and how we enact the self-same symbols that were in the beginning of our spiritual journey from baptism. In other words, we want to familiarize and let the family know that as we put the pall on the casket, it's recalling our baptismal gown. We want them to realize as the holy water is, is given uh, over, the, over, the, over the body or the cremains, that that's a holy place, a holy water, and that recalls the waters of baptism. And the candles, the candle, certainly the paschal candle is so self-explanatory that we've died and, rose, and risen with Christ. And that's a symbol as well. The music, the liturgies, the word, the supper, the supper narrative, the Eucharistic celebration, 
All of that is recognizing our real identity in the breaking of the bread. And in realizing our true identity in the breaking of the bread, we celebrate what really is important. There is an allowance for funeral liturgies outside of Mass, and the prayers that we do at that particular part of the, of the liturgy are all there. It's recommended that the liturgy take place, uh, the funeral liturgy take place within the Eucharist, but that's developed down through time. It is an option. <clears throat> Sometimes if I do do a funeral liturgy outside of Mass, I always meet with the family and talk to them. We always have to do that. We want to do that. Because ministry is being present with people. So when I meet with them, I say to them, you know, we have to have a Mass. I'll offer a Mass. And I think it's so important that you come together for a Mass as well, perhaps at a later date. Never know the circumstances. Maybe there are pastoral reasons why the funeral liturgy outside of Mass is offered. It may be that there's sickness in the family, it may be extreme age, and all of her friends or his friends can't come. It may be uh, they get there and it's difficult, they can only go for a short time. There's lots of reasons why, long distances. There's loads of reasons why, why, we, why we have this, you know, that option that's allowed by the ritual. But the ideal, of course, is always to celebrate in the breaking of the bread because that's our true identity. So all of the options are here, the music options, the readings, all you need to do, and I tell my, I tell my students who end up being pastoral associates, my students would be lay ecclesial ministers, and that ties in with baptism as well. I teach at, at St. John's Seminary, I teach in the Institute, and it's for lay formation. And in, in their training and in their formation, uh, they're going to be the ones who are going to help people to plan. So they're lay ecclesial ministers by virtue of their baptism. And all of us, the most radical thing that happened to any of us is that we died and rose in Christ in baptism. Everything else, sacramentally, is making that more explicit. Uh, the fact that we are a Christian first before, before we're really anything else. There is very much a journey that we take with those who are suffering a loss of a loved one. The journey really moves us on different stops and starts uh, throughout a couple of days, usually. It starts with more or less a critical phase in, in pastoral care. When we first meet with the family, it could be, it could be in a nursing home or it could be in a hospital, uh, and it could be at the death or it could be at the funeral home. But at that time, there are special prayers for the gathering together in the presence of the body. And then the first liturgical action is the vigil. And the vigil is what is the time when we watch and wait for the Lord to return again in glory. The vigil ideally is offered in the church. Ideally, we don't have to have a funeral parlor. That's not a liturgical place. What we have for the liturgical place certainly is is the, is the church itself. And that gathering in the presence of the Lord, that gathering together makes all the difference. And so the vigil is a time for offering that, that time. And then we also have the actual funeral mass and then of course the burial in a sacred place. And that burial is what brings to us the sense of being part of the household of faith. And in consecrated ground, in, in prayer, we, we wait for the Lord's return again in glory. And we wait for the resurrection on the last day. The updated version I promised to talk to you about ever so briefly is called Peace Beyond Understanding. And in this one, I actually move into other, other topics such as cremation and, and the Psalms and all of the, the ritual. But the title itself is a prayer, and we can end with that that we pray for a peace that's beyond understanding. That's rooted in, this, in, the, in the ritual and it's rooted in St. Paul. All of us pray that that understanding, that meaning, uh, will be given to us and something even beyond that will take over and give us the peace of the Lord.